thank you for, for having me here and uh, thank you everyone for joining. And yeah, as you uh, mentioned, the kind of B2B opportunities in, in cultivated meat have uh, really been one of the most exciting kind of developments in this industry from my perspective in the last couple of years. So very lucky uh, and honored to be able to introduce a, a, a panel of uh, founders of really, yeah, four key B2B cultivated meat companies that each address a different kind of aspect of the, the value chain, at least as GFI um, would, would uh, kind of bucket things. So without further ado, I will briefly introduce our panelists, but then they'll, they'll provide a more uh, in-depth interview uh, in a moment. First, we have Dr. Patricia Bubner, founder and CEO of Orbillion Bio, which um, is kind of in the, the cell line space. We'll hear more, more about that. Dr. Bjorn Ovar, co-founder, CSO, and head of business development at ORF Genetics, which in essence is, is cell culture media and more. Dr. Jed Johnson, co-founder and CTO of Matrix Meats, which focuses on scaffolding and structure. And then Leo Gronewegen, founder and CEO of Cellular Revolution, which uh, focuses on bioprocess. As Ahmed mentioned, my name is Nate Crosser, startup growth specialist at the Good Food Institute. And are the other panelists in? Yep, it looks like it. Great, so a couple of just quick, uh, relatively quick round robin intros here. Uh, in the order that I introduced you all, could we please go around, introduce yourself a little bit more in depth, your background, and uh, a little bit about your company you know, five minutes or less, and just know that the next round will be a little bit more about your technology and uh, how it would contribute to the scaling of the, the supply chain. So uh, Patricia, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Nate. Um, Nate, would that be appropriate right now to show my slide deck? Sure. Perfect. Hello, everyone. I am excited to join. Let me quickly get the, the slides up so you have something to look at other than my face. Um, make it a little bit bigger. Okay, I hope you can all see. Let me know if not. And yep, here we see. go. Perfect, thank you. So yeah, talking about uh, cell lines, right? Why cell lines? And to be honest, every cultivated meat company out there is a cell line company because we all need them, right? And one of the major issues right now as we're talking to bringing this product actually to the market is that cultivated meat is still too expensive. So our billion bio is really focused on radically reducing the cost of developing scalable cell lines. What does that mean? How do we get them from the source material that may be a biopsy or something else to a scalable process? How can we fine tune these uh, cell lines to make sure that they perform in a bioprocess at scale. And we all know that scalability, and I'm sure Leo has a lot to say about that, is one of the big problems in cultivated meat and in bringing the cost down because there are so many unknowns. So being able to replicate conditions at scale as best as possible at a small scale, that's what our billion bio is doing. We use a combination of microfluidics, synthetic biology, machine learning and AI to select the best conditions, the best cell lines, and are able to do high throughput screening on a lot of different cell lines and combinations. And that allows us to select cell lines that scale faster, that we can draw conclusions off on how they fare in a bioprocess and simulate certain realistic conditions on these cell lines. And the goal for us is to provide premium cultivated meat products from a variety of different cell lines and breeds. And um, this is especially important because now that we have a market, okay, it's one country, but the others are coming. Um, there will be, of course, a demand for more different types of meat than let's say just one type of meat. So we're trying to really build up a pipeline of different meats and different cell lines that you can use for them because different cell lines doesn't mean different species. It means really different cell lines from different species and retaining a sort of biodiversity in the cell lines that we can offer and that we can make products out of that. And to be honest, none of us yet knows what exactly the impact on taste is. And by having a repertoire of different cell lines, we can at least start to explore that. The team behind Rebellion Bio, we are experienced professionals 
coming from different areas with a set of advisors that I'm insanely proud of and we're so glad to have them on board. So we cover everything from the mechanobiology of cells to synthetic biology and the scale-up processes as well as what makes good meat and um, the, the big uh, protein providers, what do they need? Um, currently, we're looking forward to opening up our seed funding round next year and um, because um, we currently have a little bit of uh, work to do, we're also, and sorry for hijacking this for this, we're currently hiring to grow our amazing team. And uh, so if you want to work with a cultivated meat company, have a background in cell and engineering, tissue engineering, want to work in sunny Southern California, please definitely reach out to me, let us know, and um, looking forward to hear from you. And I know that was less than five minutes, but I'm a fast talker, what should I say? So um, yeah, that's it from my side for now. Thanks Wonderful. All. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, ne never let a good platform go to waste. I, I appreciate that. Bjorn would love an introduction. Yes, hi there. Uh, thank you, Nate. So my name is Bjorn Urvar and I'm the uh, co-founder and CSO of Org Genetics. This is a biotech company. We started here in Iceland about 20 years ago. My background actually is in plant molecule genetics, but uh, I received my PhD in, from University of British Columbia uh, many years ago. I uh, worked then for three years at uh, McGill University in Montreal uh, before I moved back to Iceland and where I started with two of my colleagues or genetics. And uh, in the beginning, the focus was on developing a production platform in plants for recombinant uh, human growth factors. But in 2007, we launched our first product line, which is called Isokine Growth Factors for stem cell research specifically. And, and in 2010, uh, we launched a completely different product uh, called BioEffect Skincare Line, uh, which are based on growth factors, uh, which are now sold uh, today in more than 27 markets globally. And this uh, product line has been very successful, but and we need some of those uh, revenues to, to, to continue with uh, developing other avenues, other technology and so forth. And uh, this year we launched actually a new product line, the so-called mesokine growth factors, a portfolio of growth, uh, growth factors focusing on animal growth factors that are specifically developed for the cell culture meat industry. So we are we are now uh, kind of introducing this new line of animal growth factors to the to the this new world to us of our stem cell uh, uh, or meat uh, stem cell meat uh, production. Thank you. Wonderful, uh, Jed. All right, hello everyone, and uh, thank you, Ahmed and Nate, for allowing us to talk a little bit and uh, introduce ourselves. So. I'm Jed Johnson, Chief Technology Officer for Matrix Meats. And Matrix Meats is a spin out out of a company called Nanofiber Solutions that, that I started 10 years ago. We make scaffolds for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. And Matrix Meats takes that technology and applies it to the cultivated meat space. So we utilize our, our expertise in material science and we partner very closely with, with our customers who are in cultivated meat companies, and we work with you to develop custom scaffolds for your application. And, and whether that's growing uh, heirloom breed cells, like what Patricia mentioned, or crickets, or uh, anything in between there, we have scaffolds that, that essentially plug and play for your application. So some of our partners are utilizing large bioreactor stirred tank systems, others are, are growing cuts or, or fillets of, of meat. And so the scaffold can help support all of those applications. So we can go into to some of the deeper tech as, as the questions progress, but essentially we're a species agnostic. And so any type of cell you're trying to grow, we can help. So thank you. Wonderful, thanks. Leo? Yeah, hi. So, um... My name is Leo Groenewegen. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Cellular Revolution. Um, we aim to become the leaders of in continuous cell culturing technologies, meaning that we are a B2B business developing technologies for the culture meat sector for companies growing cells at scale to use and um, put in their pilot plans, for example. 
Um, we'd like to say we do it a bit differently than other sort of bioreactor companies. Um, current production of bioreactors uh, and production of cells basically is all batch based. Uh, we developed a novel type of manufacturing process where actually we move from a batch production method to a continuous production method, meaning that we have ongoing production 24 seven, which leads to yield, scale and, and cost reductions. Um, the biggest challenge, like many of you know, for culture meat is scalability. You know, going from growing a few cells in the lab to actually, so we've done some numbers. We think that annually you will need a, about 10 to the factor 20 cells annually. Um, that is equal to all the grains of sand that we have on earth. So the issue of scaling is really, at least in our opinion, the biggest issue to overcome. And with scaling comes yield, resource consumption, and lowering of production costs, um, where we see that uh, B2B businesses especially can make a large difference because, I mean, the calcium meat companies, they need to focus on, on their sort of, uh, the things that they're best at, which could either be, you know, their specific cell line and specific way of how you actually go from cells to meat. Um, we are the best at producing or making, developing the technologies that allows them to do so by all collaborating or focusing on our individually sort of strengths we think that we can make a real sort of impact in the industry over the coming years and actually making culture meat moving from either a, a laboratory scale or only a very high end restaurant scale to something actually you can see in your local supermarkets, whether it's Tesco, whether it's Albert Heijn, whether it's wherever you are, that actually the, the everyday consumer can have access to culture meat and to its benefits. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. And it's fascinating to see kind of the supply chain comprised of all these people with different backgrounds and from entirely different industries all kind of coming together uh, to create this, this you know, world-changing uh, suite of products potentially. So I think before we, I'd like to deep dive into kind of each of these value chain areas, but before we do that, I think it would be helpful to kind of zoom out in a big way and just go through in the, in the order we just went and as succinctly as you can, what is kind of the core of your technology solution and how does that contribute to the scaling of the cultivated meat industry? So, so brownie points for brevity here. Uh, so Patricia, could you start us off? Sure. Um, the core of our technology is true high throughput screening that is assisted with machine learning and image analysis to rapidly identify and learn what makes cell lines better at scale looking at traits such as uh, proliferation, doubling times, viability, and so on. And also, of course, to generate new cell lines by using either genetic engineering or selection through high throughput screening. Wonderful, we can just, uh, I think Bjorn, you're next. So uh, <clears throat> we have been uh, producing uh, our isokine growth factor for stem cell research for uh, more than 13 years. But our technology platform is basically based on bioengineering and barley plant to produce the uh, growth factor in the barley seed, then grow these uh, barley plants in our hydroponic uh, culture in our greenhouse. And then for further scale up, we use uh, infield cultivation and and, uh, but using our technology, we believe that uh, we can both dramatically reduce the cost of these uh, growth factors as well as scale up the production very fast for the cell culture meat industry. And keep in mind that uh, our bioreactor is simply the bioengineered barley seed. It's not a capex demanding steel tank or anything like that. Okay. Thanks. And the scaffolds that, that Matrix Meats produce uh, really help in three areas. One, we, we allow yourselves to grow faster. Two, we help improve differentiation efficiency. So more of your cells are turning into, into your final product. Uh, and three, we can provide some extra value adds. So texture or flavor or color uh, to your final product that you can't achieve with just cells alone. Yeah, so what is sort of setting us apart or what our, how our technology is different is like, a, like I said a bit in the beginning, it is the approach we're taking to cell culturing. 
It is the fact that we are currently the only company capable of continuous production of cells, of adherent cells at least, um, which looking at the numbers that we've at least calculated, gives you again a huge increase in yield, uh, lowers your footprint, lowers your resource consumption, and overall allows you to grow cells at a scale and at lower cost, which especially for, for adherent cells, especially for cultured meat cost, is the main driver, of course, because again, you need everything in supermarkets. Um, we have developed two products in a way to do that. Um, so we have a peptide-based coating, which in, allows for increased proliferation of cells. Um, and it also allows for single cell self-detachment. So, so combining this coating with our proprietary bioreactor allows for the creation of a continuous system where we can continuously create cells, can be harvested, can be collected, new cells can grow which then makes sure that as a culture meat company, for example, you have a steady output, steady throughput of cells being produced, which also makes it in a way easier to handle than a batch, where suddenly you have millions and millions of cells available on Monday morning, and you need to process them. And actually having a steady flow of, for example, a thousand cells per hour uh, will be much easier to deal with as well from a technical perspective. Great, thank you. So now let's uh, do kind of a, a short deep dive into each value chain area, roughly kind of in, you know, the uh, temporally how the product development process would happen. So we'll start naturally with cell lines, the thing that we want to get trillions of that people uh, can eat. Uh, so Patricia, what type of cell lines uh, is Orbillion working on and why is the, the choice and availability of cell lines important for the growth of the industry? Yeah, so at Orbillion Bio, we are not restricted uh, from the type of cell lines that we're working with. So be it um, stem cell lines or um, iPSCs or somatic cell lines, all of them have their point right now in the industry and they're different companies working with different cell lines. One of the things that we're lacking currently is a certain standard. What is the ideal cell line that we want to work with? And that may be different from depending on the species that you want to work with and also depending on the point of time, meaning right now there are certain species where we know more about certain cell lines, how to identify them, how to get them. Uh, it's not that straightforward, for example, to get iPSCs for each of the species that um, people want to eat. So um, right now it may be preferable for certain companies to work with a specific cell line from a specific species, but that may change in the future. And um, that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to have multiple cell lines. The other is we are not sure how consumer acceptance will look like for, for example, genetically modified uh, cell lines. There are companies that stay completely away from that because of that risk. So, um, but on the other hand, we of course see the advantage as scientists in having uh, genetically modified cell lines um, and, and that may be desirable too in the future. So you can work on all these different cell lines only if you have the means to do that at a small enough scale and with a high throughput system because it's simply too, too time consuming and too expensive to do all of that at a larger scale. And so, you know, currently we're working with uh, beef, with sheep, and also um, with deer cell lines and we're adding on to that bison. So we have a variety of different species for different reasons, mostly um, because of the market and, and consumer interests, of course. So that's our basis. And then um, for the future, I think we will see that expanding a lot. One of the areas where I see where we need significant improvement is uh, in seafood and fish, where there's just very, very little known about the biology of fish. Sometimes we don't even have the tools there to identify, is this a muscle cell line or not? And we have similar problems with some of the mammalian cell lines, but in general, we have more tools and research is very quickly um, catching up there because now there's finally more interest, more government funding also pouring in that is in, in general really important. Um, so, you know, I think we will see a lot of movement there in the next couple of years. Thank you. And, and what about the... Um the type of, of cell itself. So like induced pluripotent stem cell versus another type is, you know, does that play an important factor in the ability to scale? And, and if so, Absolutely. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it really depends again on the scaling process that you want to run, right? Do you want to work with adherent cells? Do you want to work with suspension adapted cells? We know that some of the companies out there prefer certain types of cells that they can grow at higher densities because they are suspension adapted. And that might, might not be a preference for someone that wants to make um, a, a 3D tissue, right? Or only at a later point in time. So it's really dependent on the type of reactor you have and on the type of product that you want to create. And that's um, beautiful because it also shows us how much diversity we really have in this industry. And I really look forward to all the different products that we will see coming out in the next couple of years by different players inspired by different cultures also and, and food cultures on the world. So that's why we need that diversity in cell lines for the processes, for the flavor, and for the products that we want to see. Okay, thank you. And then one more question on, on this topic. So what what are the greatest challenges in the industry uh, as it relates to cell lines? Or put it another way, imagine 20 years in the future, we have widely available cell lines of every species that are in a format that they're available to companies um, and they're very usable. What were the key things that, that happened or need to happen for that to exist? I love that approach, Nate. Um, thinking about leading from the future, I think that's generally a good guidance on how we should do applied research, right? What is it? What are the traits that we want to see? So um, scalability in a broad sense, meaning having a repertoire of cell lines that are both um, adapted to high density cell cultures, but also whose biology is just very well known, both um, on, a, on a genetic level, but also on a proteomic and on a glycomic level, and then on a, on a level where we know the whole nutrient content of the cell and can fine tune it. So having that available would be a massive advantage for the industry. And the current hurdles right now is again, we, we, we lack the exact knowledge for a lot of these cell lines on both how to, um, sometimes how to reprogram them to iPSCs, or there are only certain very few protocols out there um, that are, are sometimes if you look into things that have been published, they may not always work as well as you thought they should. So having protocols established for all these different cell types that are openly available, I think that would really move the industry forward. Great, thank you. And just in the interest of time, we'll move on to bioprocess. So the, you know, now that we have those cells, what are the the tools and systems we put in place to be able to produce those at really large scales. And uh, Leo, you, you talked about this a little bit, but maybe you could, you could um, you know, just describe it in a little more detail. How specifically is Cellular Revolution's approach to scaling up bioprocess? You know, how, how does that enable the industry to produce at the scale and at the price points? that we need to be able to compete, compete with like conventional animal products eventually. Sure, thank you, Nate. Um, so what we mainly focus on is the proliferation phase. So the phase where you go from say, having one cell in the lab to having a few million cells, which later on you can put in your scaffold or you can make into a meat product. So it's the, in, the initial proliferation stage where the cells are sort of growing, proliferating, and actually before they differentiate and before they go onto a scaffold. This is really where you're trying to get sort of mass cells. So you like, you like to scale up the amount of cells and after that you can either differentiate them, you can store them, you can do basically whatever you like with them. Um, the problem there again is how do you get enough of those? Um, I, I sort of touched upon, I mean, there's a difference between batch production methods and continuous methods. So a good way of sort of looking at the difference in a way is comparing a, a ferry with a, with a bridge. So a ferry is a batch production system where you put cells in, just like in a ferry, you put cars on or people. Yeah, you ship it across, you empty it, you clean it, you fill it up again and you start again and you go back. Uh, a continuous production system is like a bridge where continuously people, cars are sort of going across, which gives you this, this sort of steady and reliable um, output. Um, if you look again, scalability, there's lots of issues, there's lots of different bioreactors. I mean, you have rock bed bioreactors, third tank, you have single use production methods, and you have continuous now. They all have the benefits, they all have the drawbacks. Um, depends again on the cell line. Uh, suspension cells, generally speaking, are easier to grow at scale. 
But then on the other hand, there's a lot of cells currently out there, especially for calcium that are adherent cells. So that actually suspension might not be a good solution. If you look at scaling up of adherent cell bioreactors, and so just using your, your sort of standard bioreactors like used in the pharmaceutical industry, um, the moment you start scaling, you get issues with, with cell viability, uh, shear stress, and all the sort of issues that you get when you sort of scale and make the bioreactor bigger. Um, the, the system we have developed actually does not have these issues because it's not having millions and millions of cells in one big tank stirring and, and, and touching or not touching the media. Actually, it is a lower amount of cells in the bioreactor, but coming out continuously, thus making overall um, a higher production throughput. I mean, what, what is interesting to see, so we did some tests uh, a while ago um, in a 30-day period. So we used a, a four-time, um, no, sorry, six-time smaller bioreactor. We ran it for uh, 30 days, and we were able to have more than two times the yield compared to a conventional batch production bioreactor. So even looking at scaling, if you would move from a batch production system to a continuous system, you will need to scale your bioreactors actually less, so less liters, for the same or even a higher output. So even though everybody needs to scale, bioreactors need to get bigger. But saying that, for example, in a conventional bioreactor, you need to move to a scale of 100 liters. Well, with a continuous system, as an example, you would be able to do that at, at a much larger, a smaller size. So the smaller size, meaning you need, you know, in a way, fewer investments, you need fewer resources, fewer operators, overall sort of reducing the entire footprint of your production, again, making it more efficient, and in total, making a production system that is actually much more sustainable, more user-friendly, and actually sort of allows you to make that move again from small scale to, to larger scale production and larger scale, mainly not in production as in the size of your production plant, but larger production as in a larger cell output. Thank you. And, and I guess one follow up here. So you'd mentioned, you know, the various approaches of batch versus continuous, et cetera, as well as the different kind of technologies that can be used. Do you think that we're going to uh, converge uh, in, in terms of, so like, you know, there's many different kinds of bioprocesses that, that people could follow. Do you think we're going to get more and more kind of like diversity of bioprocess or are we going to converge onto like, this is the, the bioprocess that most companies are following? Well, I mean, from my perspective, of course, I would always love to have everybody using our continuous system. I mean, that's just, that's just best for me. Um, what I see, of course, there's, there's going to be companies trying it different ways. There's, there's people developing different types of bioreactors, different services to grow the cells on. Um, and, and that's going to be, at least, at least initially, especially, people are going to try to figure it out themselves uh, or trying to find new methods. Um, say when you really look towards sort of really commercializing the cultured meat and really go to this more professionalized production, that's the time that you'll see the winners, basically. The companies actually have the, the science behind the bioreactors, right? And they're actually able to deliver. Um, so initially, there might be some more companies popping up. Um, technologies being used from Biopharma, for example, being adapted, adjusted to, to cultured meat. Um, in the end, the, there will be some clear winners. There will be some companies can actually say, yes, our technology is better because we have tested it, because we have run pilot plans with this and this cultured meat companies. And that is when you see um, a choice going in a specific direction. Um, again, that will de depend and there will be differences between adherence and suspension cells and the type of bioreactors that are most suitable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So now we have our cells. We have a process for getting those cells to proliferate. Um, there might not be only one way of doing that, but, you know, even if companies are reducing the amount of media needed, we do need something to deliver nutrients. And, uh, media is the predominant way of doing that. So I'll transition over to Bjorn and ask, why is low-cost cell culture media important? Well, I think uh, the uh, uh, obviously there are many technical issues uh, to be solved, and some of them actually uh, huge challenges. And uh, but we believe that a lot. One of them is definitely being the huge cost of growth factors as well as selection and optimization of the best combination of these growth factors to use. Uh, so not only limiting uh, the development of these growth factors that are 
to developing or using growth factors that are uh, currently available at lower price or and so on so and i think this has to be uh, solved sooner than later and we can see that uh, all the calculations on media cost and so forth already the the bottleneck seems to be uh, the cost of those growth factors and when we uh, entered this scene uh, we thought actually that uh, that with our technology we might actually be uh, in a position to really reduce the, the the cost of those growth factors yeah and then so why did you um start um you know with uh why did why did you choose barley in, in the kind of plant molecular farming uh realm yeah. well uh, uh barley is a extremely difficult plant in bioengineering but we still thought it would be worth the risk to focus on the barley and uh, and uh, but it, because it has some features that are very practical for large scale production such of, uh, of recombinant proteins such as growth factors for uh, that are needed for cell cultured meat industry first of all the barley seed is a good protein producer uh, by nature and also uh, more importantly it can actually store uh, these unstable proteins such as the growth factors more or less indefinitely in the seed so it's like a natural uh, storage vehicle uh, for these growth factors intact and for a long time and this makes uh, logistics and stockpiling so much more easier and uh, then it is important that uh, the barley plant is actually biologically contained plant and uh, it doesn't cross pollinate neighboring plants and so on which makes the infield cultivation easier for the regulatory body to to actually to accept and uh, we have uh, gained uh, important experience in our seed based uh, system but we have now produced more than 40 uh, different human and animal growth factors in the in the last years uh, in the barley seed and since we started focusing on on these growth factors and they all appear to have the similar bioactivity that can be compared with uh, growth factors that are already produced in the traditional system so it is this uh, scalability which is a uh, uh, really important scalability and the and this uh, and the nature of the barley seed basically yeah do you have an idea for you know once we're at scale um with a, a plant molecular you know uh, uh production and purification system how much that can lower the overall cost of both growth factors and the cell culture media well we are we are alre already on this journey to really reduce the the cost of those growth factors to uh, ccm companies and and uh, we expect that we can bring down the cost of those growth factors in the next uh, two to three years to 50 to 100 times and then we will continue this journey for the next few years so our aim is basically to reach the level uh, the cost level that is needed for a consumer product based on using those growth factors and uh, so but the main advantage of uh, of the system is uh, it's the seed uh, you can uh, you can store the seed uh, indefinitely and and uh, the scale up is very economical and also you can scale it up really really fast so this is actually helping us uh, with this development and and of course uh, these seeds do not have any endotoxins so to worry about great thank you and then to to the last uh, aspect of the supply chain here so say you know we've got uh, many thousands of, of kilos of cells here um, but we need to find a way to either keep them alive uh, or to put them into a final product to uh, you know mature or or you know get the structure that people want when they're eating a meat product and this is where scaffolding comes in uh, so jed could you just talk a little bit about why scaffolding is is so important for for cell-based meat yeah, and you know, full disclosure, I'm, I'm a material science engineer, so I, I think scaffolding is really important. But there are applications where if you have uh, it, it's very biology dependent. So if your cells can grow in suspension, and you're going to produce pure biomass, and you're going to grind it, and, and you know, you 
might not need a scaffold at all. But if you want to produce a, a fillet of, of fish or steak or, or some sort of textured piece of meat, then a scaffold is probably going to be really important. Or if your cells need to be adherent onto something to grow, you know, right now you can use traditional microcarriers like a like a cytodexine, for example, and grow those cells. But then you have a, a step of adding chemicals to release those cells back off of there. So, utilizing some of our scaffold materials, you can grow them on microcarriers that can then be consumed in the final product, or they can be degraded and and removed out of the media by the time you're harvesting your final product. So, you know, there's there's reasons there to show either faster growth on our materials or uh, better efficiency when you're differentiating the cells, say into IO tubes, for example. So a lot of applications of why you might want to use a scaffold in that final product. Great. And, and there's a, a couple of questions I think relevant here in the chat. And what, one's about wanting to know if you know of any fungi-based uh, okay. uh, approaches to scaffolding. So I, I guess I would expand the question and say, what are a few of the approaches to scaffolding and uh, why, did, why do you think uh, nanofibers are the best? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And so if you look at the, the big world of scaffolds, you can come across all sorts of things. So uh, hydrogel is one that you see a, a lot of. Uh, and then particularly here in the, the, I'll say, cell ag space, you see a lot of decellarized plant-based materials. So just like in regenerative medicine, we can decellarize human or animal tissue. In the, in the food sector, we can decellarize other plants, other vegetables, fruits, and utilize that cellulose backbone that, that's remaining as a scaffolding material. So hydrogels, decellarized materials, uh, a third category would be the, the fung, sort of the fungal kingdom, and the main one there is mycelium. And there's uh, at least one company that I know of in the mycelium space, and it, it's actually a pretty neat application that, that they have applications ranging from house insulation to uh, tissue engineered constructs to food. So, so similar to nanofibers, what we can do. And, and then there are, let's say, other ways to produce scaffolds. So 3D printing is another version, and then electrospinning, and that's the technology that we use, electrospinning, to produce some of these scaffolds. So there's there's certainly pros and cons to every application, and, and I can't say one technology is going to be better for you than another one without really knowing your biology and your processes. And so I think it's important to have a, a range of tools available. So, you know, I, I like to look at automobiles as an example. If you have a Jeep and you drive it off road and you put your Michelin race tires on there, that's not gonna work out very well. And conversely, if you have your racing sedan and you put your big budding tires on there, that's not gonna work very well. And so there are applications where Mycelium might be the, the best bet, or a traditional cytodex feed, uh, or no scaffold at all might be your best option. And then there are applications where the, the combination of materials that we can use, the mechanical properties that we can achieve, and the, the sort of value added components that we can add into our fibers to be present in the final scaffold make the most sense for some, for some of the bulky meat companies. Great, thank you. And, and I wish we had like five more hours to unpack like all of these, <laughs> these different areas. But um, uh, arguendo, we now have a, um, we now have skilled cultivated meat. So congratulations, everyone. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left. So I have a, a few kind of targeted questions that I'll ask to a um, specific person. And just in the interest of time, we probably won't do a round robin on those, but if anyone does have kind of a burning addition they would like to add, um, they can go ahead and do that. And then I'll have a couple more round robins at the end. And if the audience does have any additional Q&A, put in a Q&A box and I'll, I'll try, to, try to fit it in as well. So this first one is uh, for Patricia. And it's what, is, what, what do you see, and it's a little bit similar to a previous question, I apologize. What do you see as the kind of biggest hurdle to the success of this industry right now? Uh, and bonus points if it's not what you're currently working on. 
or, or something outside of that? Unless, unless, um, unless it's... Question Nate, why would I not work on the biggest hurdle of cultivated uh, people? <laughs> you got me. <laughs> anyway, no, you know, I mean, this is a relevant question. Let me answer it this way. First of all, for me, and I guess for everyone on this panel, there is no question that cultivated meat will be successful. And look at the people on this panel, look at people in other companies at universities that are working on this. I mean, there is a bunch of very, very smart and well-trained people working on really cracking this issue. And um, this panel also shows that collaboration is crucial for that because you cannot solve this alone. So I think what, what we will need to do and what I, what I see, what I would like to see more of is really collaboration and a little bit more, um, let's say, openness about certain things. That's why I think academic research is very important. Also the collaboration of companies with uh, academic research institutions is important because there is so much out there that we can unlock that there will be enough for everyone to build their own product line, to build their own process, to build their own specifics and product for this huge 1.4 trillion market, right? So maybe um, a little bit unpopular, but one of the biggest risks is maybe the the closed upness of the industry right now, because we know that we are all very early stage. Most of us are. There are a couple of us that are farther along, but most of us are at a ver very early time point and try to sell it as if we were not. So I wish that would, would get a little bit of more unpacked because I think again, that would make it easier for all, for all of us to get along, um, get, get along faster. So, but yeah, there's for me, no doubt that this will be successful. It just, of course, has demonstrated that beautifully recently that it is possible. And I think we all cannot thank them enough for paving the way for everyone else that will, will come afterwards. What we need to be very careful about is, of course, the safety aspect of the product. So I'm always a little bit worried about somebody shooting too fast and then we see something happening that may set the industry back. Um, I love seeing the safety initiative that was recently also um, put together by, by New Harvest um, and uh, where all the companies work together on making sure that we get um, safe products out there, that we get safe processes. I know FDA and USDA are working on that and I think all of us are happy to work with them. And of course, the initiatives that the GFI puts forward to that and are super, super important. And I think uh, also in, in terms of the, the season right now, I want to thank everyone that is supporting the business, be it via volunteer work, being by putting money or, or time uh, and effort into this. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good points about kind of the inherent nature of the space race that has cultivated meat and kind of the, the incentive structures that it creates. So uh, re relatedly, in the same spirit of collaboration, Leo, uh, you know, what do you see the implications of this emerging B2B ecosystem in uh, cultivated the cultivated meat supply chain being? Yeah, so, so what I've been saying basically for the last two years is, is that culture meat without a, a proper ecosystem will not become a success. It is extremely hard for individual companies to make it from, from zero to market without the proper support of other companies. Uh, you see it in most other industries, B2B, uh, the ecosystem companies actually developing the technologies, the materials, the bioreactors, the scaffolds. Those are extremely crucial in getting the market to the next stage, basically. Um, and I see, of course, that within, within these sort of B2B businesses and between the B2B and the B2C businesses, especially at this early stage, um, it is extremely important to work together to collaborate. Um, openness is very important. Of course, openness is sometimes complicated because you have your IP protection, you have your ideas, your inventions. Uh, but by actually collaborating, by working together, we will be able to move the industry forward um, much faster. So, I mean, we as a company are very much always open to, to collaborations, both with uh, other B2B businesses, with the B2C companies, um, but also with, with research groups and universities, um, mainly, maybe especially so because ourselves, we are a university spin-out. Um, our technology so behind the company we have now was actually developed at Newcastle University in the UK. Um, so we also were aware that how important it is to actually collaborate with, with research, with universities and, and with third parties. And 
I cannot see a future for, for culture meet basically without these kind of collaborations. Um, individual companies, again, I mean, there might be a few companies that are extremely funded that they can figure things out themselves, but the majority of companies will need help. I mean, it's so much easier. Imagine you, you start a culture meet company next year and you can go to us for your bioreactor. You can go to um, or billion for your cell line. You can go to whoever else for your media, for your scaffolds. You purchase it all and you can get started basically with your science and with your product optimization right away. That will make everything so much easier for new market entrants. And that is what we're there for. So it is important now to together develop our technologies, whether it's the bioreactor, the scaffolds or the media, work together so that in the coming years, when we're actually commercializing, that it's become so much easier for everybody to, to make use of each other's technologies, of the ideas generated and of the technological advancements. Well said, thank you. And uh, for the next one, Bjorn, I'm, I'm excited to ask you this question because I thought you, your company did a great job with your cosmetics lines like BioEffect. Um, you know, what what role do you think this these B2B companies that really are cultivated meat companies and, and you know, are happy to be part of the industry, what role do they play in kind of the end game of communicating with consumers or, or talking about the industry, even though they're not developing, you know, end consumer products? Well, I think uh, transparency is extremely important. And uh, mind you, when we uh, launched our BioEffect uh, Skin Care Line in 2010, it is based on using a, a genetically modified barley plant. We extract the, these growth factors from genetically modified barley plant. We never uh, tried to hide that from the beginning, from the get-go. We never tried to hide that. We just tried to explain uh, the, uh, the benefits and the options we have. And I think this is uh, very important uh, to be, uh, to educate as much about the technology never stop explaining it uh, in as diverse form as possible because uh, if you if you do the technology explanation again and again and again and uh, you're always pointing out the options you have or the few options actually you have it it is always going to help you help you and we have just experienced that from our bioeffect our GMO background is not hurting the brand, definitely not, because we we uh, we explain the benefits and we explain the options you have, and I think that this is extremely important. So we are talking about the technology, explaining the technology, and also, of course, explaining the tremendous environmental impact that this technology could have, the positive en environmental impact it could have, and also in a, a, as a as a part of animal welfare for the near future. So associated with it. So I think this is really important. And uh, then, of course, it is important to work closely with the gover with governmental bodies and to as many stakeholders as possible, to have as many involved from the beginning as possible. And, and of course, we can learn a little bit from the experience of genetically modified plants in the uh, in the uh, 90s, uh, last century and the, and the beginning of this century, that is kind of what didn't uh, turn out to, uh, it kind of was a, well, it was not so successful. And we still have a very strong anti-GMO sentiment in, uh, in Europe and so forth. So we have an example what not to do, but I think now we are faced with a completely different scene because we have so many things to offer now in terms of uh, environmental uh, issues and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so Jed, uh, you know, as, as, you, as a lot of people here probably know, this cultivated meat industry in, in many ways kind of blossomed or grew out of the, the tissue engineering industry, but there are lots of people like yourself uh, coming from material sciences or other backgrounds that are really, I think, contributing unique insights. Are there other areas of, of discipline that we could be looking or, or ways of looking that might help deliver solutions to scale for, for this industry? So like looking to biopharm or, or like biofuels, for example, or what? Yeah, the biofuels is one for sure in the, in the uh, fermentation space, but I really think for most of the cultivated meat companies, 
pharma is is the place to look, uh, and more specifically, stem cell based companies. And you know, we're we're based in Columbus, Ohio, and there's a company called Athersis, which is in Ohio as well, and they're a big mesenchymal stem cell uh, firm. And the there are examples for really all of the starting materials for cultivated meat companies in the pharma space. So if you're looking at IPS cells or allogeneic cells or you know, some sort of, uh, I'll say embryonic stem cell bank, you know, all of these starting materials have all been pushed through on the pharma space. And, and so I think there are a lot of models and, and companies we can use to the cool ideas, cool scaling concepts from uh, and apply to the cultivated meat space. Yeah, thank you. And, and there, there's certainly lots of opportunities for technology to flow the other way, right? From cultivated meat in, into other industries. Yeah, particularly, you know, in that regard, the cost is one. Some of these, these stem cell based therapies are incredibly expensive. And so if, if that is one thing that, that we as the cultivated uh, meat space can provide back to pharma, you know, reduction in cost might be one. So if we can produce cultivated meat for $10 a pound, you know, there's no way these stem cell therapies should be costing hundreds of thousands of dollars per, per treatment. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. And, and we're getting close to time. So I'll kind of ask everyone to do a parting word round robin here. And I'll, and I'll bake in the last question in the audience Q&A. And my question is, you know, imagine we've got a, a supply chain for cell-based meat in the future. Uh, what does it look like? What is your company's role? And, and the, the question from the audience member is, what is the role of the you know, the, the traditional food or meat industry in that supply chain. To the extent that you could cover that in a couple of minutes, because we have about seven minutes left, would be ideal. So we'll start with Patricia. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, I certainly see that the traditional meat industry and the cultivated meat industry will become intermingled to a certain point. I don't see a reason why there should not even be hybrid products between traditional meat and cultivated meat um, at some point. And um, I don't think that we will see a complete disappearance of traditional agriculture or farming anytime soon, or maybe not even anytime at all. Um, that's just my, my opinion on that. And <clears throat> our role as Arbillion Bio, we see ourselves as a provider of cultivated meat products made from exquisite cell lines that we optimize for rapid scale up and to be able to provide these products, of course, and to do that scale-up process for different cell lines fast. Thank you. Bjorn? Yes, well, uh, <clears throat> we, are, we see ourselves uh, and the need for us to develop our scale-up technology to scale up really fast what we're doing and, and uh, we're very optimistic we can do that but uh, we have to grow lots of plants and uh, our genetic is not a farmer so we also see ourselves uh, working with uh, a key players uh, in cultivation with farmers uh, for large-scale production of, of animal growth factors and other protests needed for cell culture meat uh, media at, uh, at mass scale so working with uh, farmers and so forth uh, we see that as, as our, our future plan. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Jed? I think just building on what Patricia said, I, I, I don't think traditional uh, slaughtered meat is, is ever going away. I mean, there's so many people that grow and produce their, their own animals for their own consumption. We'll never, we'll never displace all of that. But if we can, we can start chipping away and making inroads into that traditional slaughtered meat space. And, and I think you'll see these hybrid products coming out first. And, and you can see examples of that now, like with the Tyson chicken nuggets that have uh, a plant-based material built into them. So they're, they're sort of extending that, that slaughtered meat component. And, and I think that's where you'll see inroads of the cultivated meat space or these hybrids probably you know in full disclosure just because of cost it, it, to have a pure cultured meat chicken nugget just won't be able to compete on a price standpoint but you can start to see maybe 20 percent or, or 50 percent these cultivated meat products coming out uh, in the next year or two 
Cool. Thank you. And Leo. Yeah, so I, I agree with, with Patricia and Jet. Um, big meat or, or the big the big corporations, they will they will get into culture meat as well. They will start looking at, at culture meat in the coming years once we get closer to commercialization. Uh, because of course, from a financial point of view, it will start becoming interesting for them as well. And they will not want to miss out on this sort of new industry that's actually being created, which they can then be a relatively early sort of investor or, or participant in. Um, products that you will see in the market, of course, a, you, like Jet said, uh, a mixed product, say 50% real meat or 50% plant and 50% um, cell-based or different formulations are, are very much uh, a possibility as it's an easy way to get the product sort of into the market. Uh, I mean, looking at market share as well, I mean, we won't have culture meat, we'll not suddenly have 30% market share, 50% market share. It is something that takes years and years. Um, I would just be happy with, with just over the next sort of four or five years to see slowly an increase in market share. You know, if it's up to me, it will go up to up to 10% in the coming five years, but that is, that is very, very sort of um, optimistic, of course, and most likely will be lower. I mean, what we're doing as a company, we, we are, um, yeah, we're trying to make that happen. I mean, we're trying to get culture meat really into the market. We're trying to allow people to start selling it in the coming years. And we, we try to be so very integrated um, supply chain partner, both sort of helping with materials, but also with the, the setup of the bioprocessing systems, as a company, so what is the best way to actually start this sort of production line and uh, be a sort of collaborative partner with, with as many companies as we can. Mm -hmm. Well, great, thank you. We're, we're at time here. And uh, just before I turn it back over to Ahmed, I just wanna say it's an honor to be able to speak with the pioneers here of really the future animal meat supply chains uh, of the world. So thank you all for, for your time and I'll turn it back over.